Hey guys, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge, and I'm really excited that you have decided to take time out of your busy schedules to come and hang out today. We're really grateful for you tuning in. And if you have been listening to the podcast for a while, we really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Hopefully you have subscribed so that you never miss an episode. But if not, or if you are new to the show, get yourself over to iTunes, Stitcher, AnimalTrainingAcademy.com or whatever it is you're listening to this podcast on and hit the subscribe button to make sure you don't miss a single episode. We are bringing you today's episode on behalf of the Animal Training Academy or ATA membership. If you like the conversations in these podcasts, then I want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people within the ATA membership area, which you can find out more about over on the ATA website. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalogue of previous web classes, plus a huge library of videos and projects to problem solve different training situations and we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private facebook group forums area and whatsapp chat groups it's like a netflix social media platform for animal behavior nerds but we will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one alexander kurland Alexander Kerlin is a graduate of Cornell University, where she specialised in animal behaviour. Alex began teaching in the early 1980s. Her area of particular interest is the development of a horse's balance, physical and emotional. Helping horses stay sound throughout a long lifetime is the goal. The result are beautiful horses that, in her words, feel like heaven to ride. In 1998, Alex launched the rapidly growing field of clicker training for horses with the publication of her first book, Clicker Training for Your Horse. Alex teaches clicker training geared to any horse need or sport, including developing a gentle and companionable riding horse, halter training fowls, training advanced performance horses, and reforming difficult and unmanageable horses. Alex travels widely, giving clicking training seminars and presenting at conferences in the US, Canada, the UK, and Europe. She has written The Click That Teaches, a step-by-step guide in pictures, and The Click That Teaches, Riding with the Clicker. She has also produced The Click That Teaches DVD lesson series, an online training course, and she is presently working on new books and videos. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome Alex to the ATA podcast show today. Alex is patiently waiting by in cold upstate New York. (laughs) Alex, how are you? I'm very good. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to the podcast. I'm really excited that what I'm going to call this day has come because (laughs) lots of people have been asking me over the years to to get you on the show. Um, So I guess kind of apologies it's taken me so long. (laughs) Um, But thank you for making the time to to come and hang out with us here today at ATA. We really appreciate that. Well, I'm always delighted when the horses are are included. Yes, and let's geek out hard because I think – My background is zookeeping, um, but zookeepers, I'm not sure, I don't have metrics, uh, probably make up the smallest segment of the ATA audience possibly, and it just might be by marketing size, but uh, the horse people, are they're a huge contingency and they're hungry for this information, I think. Yes, they are, they are. And I think there's a need for it. Am I safe saying that? I think you're safe saying that, yes. Awesome. So are you ready to geek out with me? I am. (laughs) Let's get going. Hey, Alex, can you take us back? Can you take everyone listening back to your early days where you first learned about clicker training, about positive reinforcement? Take us back to that time and and share some stories from your the early part of your journey. Well, the person who introduced me to clicker training was a friend of mine who trained Irish wolfhounds. And she we were she was a trainer, a breeder of Irish wolfhounds, a good friend, and we were having lunch one day just talking as trainers do about 
various training methods that were relevant to the two species that we were passionate about. And she said in that offhand way that people do, but of course you've read Karen Pryor's Don't Shoot the Dog. And this was 1993, and I had not even heard of Don't Shoot the Dog. If Karen's publisher had insisted that she call it Don't Shoot the Horse instead of Don't Shoot the Dog, the horse community would have gotten it first, and I would have been the one asking that question. But um, her publisher uh, had her call it Don't Shoot the Dog, so the dog community got it first. And But my friend said it in, in that way that made me feel as though I really should look this book up. So I read Don't Shoot the Dog. I devoured it, as many people do. And because my background was in behavior, it was very familiar territory. There was a lot in it that I was just saying, oh, yes, of course. Oh, that makes such sense. Oh, of course, of course. But when I got to the chapter on punishment, it really struck a deep chord because the horse world relies so heavily on punishment. And when Karen started talking about all the fallout of punishment, I was reading this saying, oh, the horse world really needs to understand this. The horse world really needs to understand what we're doing when both to our horses and to ourselves when we resort to punishment. And I wasn't thinking about writing a book about it um, or anything of that sort, but it just really struck home because this really, it was such a powerful description of what we are doing um, and the fallout that we create when we use punishment with our animals. And I was also, as I read her book, I was really curious about the clicker training. And everyone who's read Don't Shoot the Dog, you know that that first edition in particular, it really, it wasn't a training manual. There wasn't a how-to. There were descriptions of this is how you go out to your barn or out to your dog and train. So I read, uh, I got her second book, Lads Before the Wind, which was her diary of her time at Sea Life Park and her descriptions of uh, developing the training for the dolphins that very early figuring out, so how do you train a dolphin? And I thought it was a fascinating book because it provided such insights into how a trainer's mind works. It's a great read and people who haven't yet read Lads Before the Wind just really should make a point of adding that to the bookshelf. But again, it didn't really give a good description of, well, how do you clicker train? And my friend lent me an article that had, um, and I actually don't know what the article was about. I, I don't even know if I read it. But down in the corner was a little, one of those tiny little inch by inch ads that Karen had put in with uh, for a video that she had produced. And I immediately sent away for that. And this was, this is 1993. So this is the dark ages. This is like the medieval period of, of videos. And, and it was one of those big clunky VHS tapes. And um, and I watched it, and there were two clips that really, really were so resonated with me that were very powerful. One was of Gary Wilkes, who was uh, who had paired up with Karen Pryor uh, to do some of the dog seminars, and. Karen always told the story that it never really had occurred to her that you could clicker train dogs. You know, she had clicker trained the Welsh ponies that she had when she was in Hawaii, but she never trained the dogs that she had. Dogs were just farm animals that sort of hung around, but you didn't actively train them. So she, it hadn't occurred to her that you would apply clicker training to dogs. And then Gary Wilkes came along and he said, yes, that the question of, well, do you suppose this would work with dogs? And Karen thought for two seconds and said, well, of course it would. And so they paired up and, and did some seminars together that introduced the dog community to clicker training. And that really was the ball that, that, that got everything rolling, that that was the push. So I watched Gary working on this video, working with a 12 week old Mastiff puppy. And he did a very, he, the, we, most of us have seen it, uh, something similar. You hold a bit of, of hot dog, a treat over the puppy's head, and the puppy looks up at the treat. And as the puppy looks up, its rear end goes to the ground and Gary's clicking and treating. And, and within just a couple of clicks, this puppy is sitting. And then he used a lure and he got this puppy to lie down. And then he's stepping back and he's walking around this puppy and 
Today, we would look at that and say, well, that's just, you know, standard clicker training. We've all seen it. If you've watched dogs being trained, there's nothing extraordinary about this. But in 1993, I'd never seen training like this. The dog training that I had seen was all push and shove. If you wanted a dog to sit down, you you put your hand on its rear end and you pushed hard. And and so it was it was really completely different from any of the dog training that I had seen in the my community. And then another video clip that was in that original uh, VHS tape was from Gary Priest from the San Diego Zoo. And he showed the, an African bull elephant. It was a trial. Uh, uh, they were doing a test run of, of could you use clicker training uh, for the captive management of these animals. And this particular elephant was extremely aggressive. And the decision had been made that no one could go into his enclosure with him because he had tried to kill his keepers on several occasions. And that meant that, as I recall, it had been 10 years, years since this elephant had had any foot care. And this was an extreme worry for the general for for the uh, general health of this elephant. So they didn't. an experiment where they made some small enclosures in the uh, big entrance gate to his enclosure. They taught him to target. And with the use of targets, they taught him to present his foot through this little opening for uh, so that it could be trimmed. And as a horse person, I watched this fascinated because, of course, if we'd had a, an aggressive horse that needed foot care, in the traditional horse world, it would have been three men and a boy holding this horse down. It would have been hobbles and lip chains, and and you would have gotten the job done. But you can't do that with an elephant. And and so uh, Gary, at one point, as this elephant is cooperating in a blood draw, he is saying, I can't stress to you enough how aggressive this elephant was. But here he is cooperating in this care for just the social attention and a bucket of carrots. And that was profoundly important as I watched that. And those two short video clips were enough for me to go out to the barn and experiment with my own horse. So I I filled my pocket with treats. I got a little plastic clicker. I put treats in my pocket. I got a, a dressage whip that was lying around in the barn. And my thoroughbred peregrine at that time was laid up with hoof abscesses. So he had uh, hoof abscesses in both of his front feet, so he couldn't walk. He was in just excruciating pain from the abscesses. But he was also a very fit thoroughbred who was used to being turned out 24-7. And I wanted to keep him mentally engaged through his layup. So I went out with a with my treats and I held a, my dressage whip out in front of him because even though he couldn't walk, he could target with his nose. And he thought it was interesting and I thought it was interesting. So we just kept playing with it. And as he felt better and could do more, I started to ask for bits and pieces, a little bit more here, a little bit more there. And I started to rework his basic repertoire of behaviors. So I reshaped everything that I had taught him. And this was a horse I had bred myself. So he had um, he had quite an extensive repertoire of groundwork, as well as work under saddle. And when he went back into work after seven weeks of layup, he was further ahead in his training than he had been when he was laid up. And so that interested me. That was that was uh, intriguing, to say the least. And we were both having such fun with it that I just kept exploring it. And I started sharing it with my clients, with their horses, and we just kept uh, expanding out what we could do with the clicker training and figuring out how it worked and what was a good procedure for getting started. And bit by bit, it just expanded into what it is today, which is a very complete training program for horses so maybe we should do the next edition of don't shoot the dog as don't shoot the horse (laughs) (laughs) well or or don't shoot the elephant (laughs) right or don't shoot the snake (laughs) 
Yeah. Or we should just ask Karen what she would really like to have called it, because yeah. it was her publisher who picked that title. That's and it was a good title, you know, because it it uh, got a lot of us to read the, read her book. Yeah. Uh, uh, no one can argue with that again. <laughs> so many people on this podcast show have said, well, it started when I picked up this book called Don't Shoot the Dog. Shoot the Dog. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, love, I, And I love hearing about, you know, that it's that one little thing that happens in your journeys. And, and for you, it, it potentially was that little tiny ad and that thing that you might not have even read. <laughs> <laughs> that led That's you to right. get led you to get this thing that you call a videotape. No idea what you're talking about there, and get that sent to you and watch this clip from Gary Wilkes. So I love that. It's it's a yeah. beautiful. Um, and I'm sure my fr- my I know my friend gave me the the Xerox copy of this article, so I would read the article. Not I don't I don't know that she even noticed the ad in the in the corner. Uh, so yes, it is you know this one little thing tweaks another and and you just keep exploring and that's the fun of these things is you never quite know what's uh, where something is going to take you, but it's that staying open to open to possibilities really. Yeah, we call it, we call it we have a name for this. We call it ripples at Animal Training Academy. This idea of you don't you don't know what influence your little your little square in the bottom of your Xerox paper yes. is, is going to have on the world. Um, and so I have a question for you. Back in 1993, you got this video, and, and you watched uh, Gary Wilkes put a hot dog over a dog's head, and. Uh, watched him train a, a 12 week old mastiff to sit down very quickly. Uh, and you described that as possibly standard clicker training today. But back then it was like, wow, look at this. Oh my God, I can't believe this. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, in, in 2018, what do you think is stuff that's going on that people are looking at and going, wow, oh my God, I can't believe that people are doing this? That in 25 years from now is going to be standard clicker training. I think probably it's what you're doing, you know, that what what is going on in the in the zoological community. This broadening out in terms of wow, you mean you can train fill in the blank. You know, uh, Ken Ramirez's phenomenal work with the butterfly experiment, and uh, you know, who knew that you could train butterflies and uh, and the the training that we're seeing being done with fish and uh, you know it's like who knew that you could train uh, the sharks and fish and the, so I think the broadening out this this understanding that uh, we live on a very intelligent planet and I think that's really where uh, that would be a lovely direction to be heading in. I think I might name this episode we live on a very intelligent planet I'm writing this <laughs> we live on a very I'm writing this down so I don't forget it because I always say I think we're going to name the podcast this and then I don't write it down so give me a second we live on a very intelligent planet beautiful I love that and it's so well, true and- well even more I mean one of the areas that and I know only a smidgen of some of the research that's been going on that's been going on. So we're getting all excited because Ken has clicker trained butterflies. But they're now starting to show that you can do things like clicker train plants. So it's not just it's not just animals that are intelligent. It's that the uh, when we start looking at some of the communication that's going on uh, with plants, it's just astounding. But now we've gone a long way from horses. Yeah, well, I like to think about the future and and have this stored. So 25 years from now, we can look back at this episode and uh, say, yeah, of course we click a train plants. I mean, come on, what are you talking about? It's just That's just standard clicker training. Um, I think that's exciting. And thank you for injecting yes. that in this episode. Um, I'm excited that we can share this with thousands of people and um, get these conversations going. Thanks so for now sharing. you'll have you'll have to have a podcast with some of the plant researchers. I hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. And I, to, and I have to keep it going for twenty five years. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, who knows what we'll be doing in twenty five years? We'll be doing virtual um, reality podcasts. I don't even know what that looks like. Um, so thank you for sharing your behavioral odyssey, as we like to call them. Can you bring everyone listening now up to speed, 2018? Uh, what are you doing? Where can people go to get in touch to see you? Tell us tell us what Alexander Kurland is doing in 2018, and then we'll move on to our next topic. Well, I am uh, involved in, in a podcast, so I'm uh, 
doing a weekly podcast with Dominique Day, who's one of the co-founders of Cavalia. So that's that's definitely uh, been an exciting venture this past year. I'm also doing clinics and conferences. So right now I'm getting all the conference presentations ready for things like the Clicker Expo and the Art and Science of Animal Training Conference that comes up in February. So um, And then it'll be the spring clinic season, and I'll have my clinic schedule listed on my website pretty soon. Before, before, before uh, mid-December, that should be up. And then at the barn, I'm uh, there with the horses, and I've this past year added um, cashmere goats to the barn, and I'm having a blast training cashmere goats there. Goats, uh, I, I had no idea. I knew they were fun, but I really didn't know just how much fun they are. And they're a phenomenal uh, bridge between the dog training and the horse training. So I'm also having fun looking at some of the training techniques that I've seen dog trainers use, but I've always looked at that going, mm, really, why, you know, I wouldn't do that with horses or, or how do you translate that to horses? And now with that, I have an animal that's the size of a dog and sort of moves, has the, the, uh, the, the, mobility in their bodies that a dog has. Um, I can explore some of these training techniques. So that's neat. Yeah, it's a cool thing to think about, this transition between horses to dogs. They've still got hooves, right? They're still kind of like, they, they, they're like physiologically, they're also kind of a morph between horses and dogs. They're still working with yes. ungulates. But. Yes. But I suspect that all the people who are listening to this going, finally, finally, we get to hear about horses. They're going, wait a minute. She's <laughs> not talking, talking about, about horses. She's talking about plants. She's talking about goats. I want to hear about horses. So we'll have to somehow bring it back to, uh, to the obsession of talking about horses. Or we can talk about cats because you clearly have one that's that people can't see, but you have a cat that is uh, weaving her way back and forth, back and forth um, across the, your computer um, panel. Yes, and knocking and, over microphones and um, yes. maybe, maybe maybe sending you messages um, via the Zoom <laughs> like that we're using <laughs> to record this. But for the horse people that are wanting more horses, don't forget. We live on a very intelligent planet. That's right. <laughs> so we're talking about all so, of the so bring So bringing that back to horses. So one of the things that I think is a real change that, that clicker training celebrates, when in the, tra- in the traditional command-based training world of, of horse training, it is a commonly held belief that horses are stupid animals. And this isn't something that is implied. It's not some subtle message that uh, that nobody really says out loud. It is actually said out loud. I have heard many trainers refer to horses as stupid animals. And they will say, because they are stupid animals, we have to use force to train them. But don't worry, dear. And it's always said in that somewhat patronizing way. Don't worry, dear. They don't feel pain the way we do. Which is yes, I just saw your, you know, that your uh, expression change it through via Zoom. I mean, it's an astounding statement. But one of the experiences that I had um, in the mid nineteen eighties, I had the very great privilege of spending a fair amount of time with Linda Tellington Jones, who was the founder of Team of Team Training, and. Linda was, I was helping her at a uh, uh, clinic that she was giving at the University of Wisconsin. And this is a, it was a big audience. And because it was at the university and there's a vet school there, there were vets in the audience. There were uh, vet students, there were trainers, there were general horse owners. And at one point, um, they brought in a chestnut thoroughbred named Perfect. He was one of those uh Big. He was probably about 16'3", and, and, and he was a big, sort of raw-boned, gawky-looking uh, thoroughbred. Very typical look uh, that you would see in many of the thoroughbreds at that time. And Linda did her body exploration. So she uh, did what she called tiger touches. She took her fingers and uh, ran them, uh, probed down uh, his top line. So various pressure points. And she started at his pole, the area right behind his ears. And as she got to his back, he all but dropped to the ground. He was in so much pain. And you could hear this gasp go up from the audience because 
What Linda was doing is she was helping people to see what was in front of their eyes the whole time, but which their belief systems was keeping them from seeing, which is how much pain this horse could be in. And that same year, in 1984, it would have been, there was an article written in one of the major horse magazines that, and was written by a vet that stated that horses do not experience back pain. And when I say this to horse people today, we just can't believe it because we, we know how much pain horses can be in. We know that saddles alone cause a great deal of back pain. And what Linda opened the door to was this whole world of, of seeing the, that we need to take care of the physical health of our animals and so now today, um, you would have, and at any competition barn, you'll see chiropractors and physical therapists and various other uh, people who are acupuncturists and so on, who are there in part because Linda opened that door all those years ago, where we could start to see horses from a very different frame. And clicker training is doing the same thing because... What clicker training does is it celebrates the intelligence of our animals. So that underlying belief system that horses are stupid animals, what we know and what so many are, the evidence so supports is that when you change how an animal is trained, you see how intelligent they are. That was one of the things that was in Lads Before the Wind that really struck me because when you read Karen Pryor's book uh, partway through, she's... She's talking about the dolphins as, you know, in a way that, you know, it's it, it's very, it breaks all the myths of, of, if you watch Flipper when you were little, that kind of thing of these dolphins as these really intelligent beings. And Karen is saying, well, they're really not any more intelligent than, than your family dog. And you go, no, no, that can't be. Dolphins are, dolphins are, dolphins are dolphins. Dolphins are, are these magical uh, beings that are so intelligent. And they're, if we can only tra- crack the code, we'll be able to talk to them. And Karen's saying, no, 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 they're just, they're they're no more intelligent than the family dog. But if we trained our dogs the way that we trained dolphins, we would discover how intelligent our dogs are. And that was the key to that. And now that we are training both our dogs and our horses in a way that is not force-based, that does not suppress behavior, what we are seeing is just how intelligent they are. Mm, so... For me, that's a story of some pretty intense cultural fog. People riding vet was it a vet riding that horses don't feel back pains, and and also the because yes. you said that was ninety four. You know that, that that also kind of opens a conversation about the longevity of cultural fog, doesn't it? I mean, twenty four years later, and you're saying you're saying people are still saying they don't feel pain. You will still hear that, absolutely. And and all you have to do is go to any tax store in the country to see evidence of that belief system. So when you look at the the spurs and the whips and the bits and the tie downs and all the rest of that, you see evidence of that of that underlying belief system. And the the challenge always when we work with horses is you have to remember that they were, you know, their their evolutionary history, that they are uh, a social species that evolved on the open plain. And if you have a horse that is injured or is uh, uh, lame in some way, and that horse is showing that he is not, um, he's not well, then he's going to draw predators into his herd. So not only is he at risk, but he puts the rest of his family at risk. So horses are very good at hiding their pain. That doesn't mean they don't feel it. That doesn't mean that it isn't there. It's just that they're really good at hiding it. And I think that's one of the things that has often misled us is how much a horse will tolerate and not show. Um, unless you start, you know, if you if you start to put them into a safe environment and you ask the right questions, you can absolutely see um, how they are feeling. But if you put that cultural fog up, and say, oh, horses don't feel pain the way we do. Um, you don't see it. You just don't see it. So clicker training is, it's shifting that. And that's, so that's one of those, how is the horse world changing? Well, it's changing dramatically in that we are understanding much more the uh, a 
emotional life of horses and, and what needs to be taken into account to provide for their welfare. Fantastic. And for our next topic that you and I discussed when we caught up a couple of weeks ago to discuss all of our uh, nerdy desires <laughs> for this episode, uh, we, we said we we're going to talk about, a little bit about loopy training, which I'm excited to talk about because we haven't dived into this in any depth on okay. the podcast show so far. Okay. So, Alex, can you explain to everyone listening well, let's start off with a definition, eh? When we say loopy training, what are we talking about and why is okay. this important? Okay. Well, loopy training is a term that uh, credit for it goes to Dr. Jesus Rosales Ruiz, who many people know uh, through the poison cue research that he did. And I had gone down uh, when when Jesus first presented with on the poison cue at the clicker expos. I my my ears went forward as it were. Um, you know, if you're and and I found that extremely uh it, it head spinning. I guess that would be the best way of putting it. And when I watched the video clips from that research of the little toy poodle, and I watched the dog under the conditions, and I suppose what we probably should do, because people may not be that familiar with it, so uh, give a, I'll give a brief description of the poison cue. So um, Karen Pryor was actually the one who, who coined the term poison cue, because she was saying, well, in the, in the research uh, studies, they can study pure positive reinforcement, and they can study pure negative reinforcement. But that's not really how the real world works. The real world is a mix of consequences. So what happens if you um, have these mixed consequences? What happens if you have a cue that is taught with both positive and negative consequences? What What is the effect of that? And so Jesus set up a research uh, study with one of his graduate students, N Nicole Murray, to begin to explore this question. And there were two conditions that this dog was uh, uh, worked under. In the first, the dog, uh, if you picture a, a room that has had a grid, like a um, some graph, uh, a grid like you would see on graph paper uh, on the floor. So they can, there are squares on this floor and they can tell from this grid where the dog is relative to the handler. And any time the dog was more than two squares away from the handler, the handler would say then, and when the dog oriented to her, she would click and give it a treat. And so over time, the dog learned that when she said then, it meant come, and the dog would come promptly and get um, uh, clicked and reinforced. And so it was shaped in the way that you would shape using positive reinforcement. It was a it was nicely done shaping uh, plan. In the second set of conditions, the dog was wearing a harness. And any time the dog was more than two squares away, the handler would say, Punir. And if the dog didn't come promptly, she would take the harness and drag the dog to her and then click and reinforce. And over time, what this dog learned is that whenever it heard Punir, it would come promptly over and stand in front of the handler. And then the quest, so this was the, this was the initial setup. So you had two cues, then and Punir, they both met come and the dog responded to both promptly. And so now the question was, can you shape with these cues? Do they work in the same way? And so in the in the first instance, what they wanted to do was to uh, watch this dog moving around the room. And any time it landed on a particular square at the side of the room, the handler would say then, and the dog would come promptly over and get clicked and reinforced because it understood that then meant come. And then they would observe the dog to see what it did next. And if it wanted to get reinforced, then the way to get the handler to click and reinforce was to figure out what had made the handler say then. So if the dog went back <clears throat> and landed on the square, the handler said then, and the dog could run over to the handler and get clicked and reinforced. And so what you saw was this clean loop of behavior. The dog would um, get clicked and reinforced, and then it went promptly back to the square, tail wagging, was doing a little happy dance, and landed on the square. The handler would say then, and the dog would come right back and get clicked and reinforced. 
In the other condition, the punir, it was the same same test, except now the square was on the other side of the room. And so the dog was wandering around the room, lands on that square because in the course of wandering around the room, it's going to pass over most of the um, uh, that part of the, the, the room, lands on the square. The handler says, punir. The dog went promptly over to the handler because it understands the word punir. And now you might think, well, this this cue should be even more powerful because not only does it avoid something it doesn't want being dragged, but it also gets clicked and reinforced. So so this should be even more powerful than the Venn cue. So let's see what happens. Well, what you see in this case is the dog wanders around the room and avoids landing on the square. He eventually lands back on the square. The handler says, punir. The dog goes promptly over to the handler. He gets clicked. He gets reinforced. He hesitates by the handler. He doesn't, he doesn't leave as promptly as he did before. And when he does leave, he doesn't go immediately back to the square. He wanders around the room. So in this case, the behavior loop is not clean. So it's a great example, non-example, when you look at these two clips. And when I originally watched this and was trying to wrap my mind around what Jesus was, was showing us with this research, I really recognized those two. I recognized those, the animal under those two conditions. When I saw this, this dog with its tail down, its head down, uh, looking very, uh, there's no energy, sort of uh, wandering, but wandering slowly around the room, glancing back up at the handler in this sort of hesitant way. And I recognized this look because I'd seen it in horses. And when I saw the the then condition and the tail up and the, the 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 happy dog and lots of energy, I also recognized that look. I'd seen it in horses, and I'd often seen it in the same horses. So this poison cue really intrigued me, and I did not want the I didn't want the poison cue research and concept to just fade away when Jesus started at the Clicker Expo to talk about other things and new people coming to the expo would not have seen this because for horses, for those of us who work with horses, I think the poison cue is really important because so many of us who have horses that have, we call them the crossover horses, horses that have been handled, trained in other types of training. So many of us are dealing with horses that have poison cues in them. And we need to recognize what a poison cue looks like and what it, what uh, the effect that it has on the training. And one of the things that really surprised Jesus when he did this research was how long lasting the poison cue was. So, I arranged with Jesus to go down to the University of North Texas and film him giving the Poison Q lecture so that we would have that preserved. And while we were sitting in his office, waiting for the graduate students who were going to help us come, and we're just chatting the way you do, you know, talking about training. And he said, you know, the thing that I admire about uh, Ken's training, Ken Ramirez's training, and Kay Lawrence's training, and your training is that you all train in loops. Well, I about fell off my chair because to be lumped in the, you know, put in the same uh, category as, as Kay Lawrence and Ken Ramirez was like, oh my goodness. Um, and, and then I was also thinking, I have no idea what you mean by loopy training, but if Ken and Kay do it, I want to do it too. And, and so... Um, Ke, Ke, uh, Jesus showed me a video clip from Kay Lawrence's work uh, that I just love. And it's a, a video where a student of hers is sitting in a chair and tossing treats out for her dog. And the dog knows to go to to follow the direction of the hand toss to find the the one piece of of kibble or whatever they were using uh, to find that on the carpet and then to turn and run back to the handler. And as she as this dog ran towards the handler, she would get clicked and then the treat was thrown again. So there was a loop, a very clean loop of behavior again. Um, so that only the behavior that you wanted was in this 
loop. There, the dog wasn't uh, wandering around the room. He wasn't uh, getting the piece of kibble and then going off to sniff other things. It was very clean, uh, repeating cycle of behavior. And then uh, once this was established, then the handler put a mat down that was in the path that the dog would travel. And what you got was this dog running back, uh, landing on the mat, getting clicked and reinforced. And it was a brilliant use of a brilliant setup because now the dog was coming to the mat, landing on the mat with the energy that you were going to want in future. And it was a great demonstration of, of Kay Lawrence's brilliant training. And it was a great demonstration of loops. And so I started really looking at and thinking about this idea of loopy training. And Jesus was right. I do train in loops. So a loop is, it's built around movement cycles. And a movement cycle is uh, the, the way that the, is easiest to describe. Um, a movement cycle is not complete until you're in position to repeat the behavior. So if I sit in a chair That's an incomplete movement cycle because until I stand up, I'm not in position to repeat the behavior. And so in the training, what we often start with, with especially when I'm working with horses that have a lot of uh, behaviors that we are finding problematic or that are horses that have a lot of poison cues, that what I want to do is find a loop of behavior uh, that is absolutely clean, where I know that if I ask this horse to give me this behavior, that I will get a yes answer. And sometimes that's a very tiny, tiny starting point. It may be as simple as um, I might be putting my hand on the horse's shoulder and I feel under my hand a tiny shift of balance. And I will click and reinforce that. He's not even taking a step yet. It's just a shift of balance. And I will click and reinforce and put my hand on his shoulder again and feel that shift of balance and click and reinforce it. And that, when I get a clean loop, that gets the ball rolling. And from that, I can build out a huge repertoire of behavior, but it will be clean. So in the loopy training, there two, the mantra is, When a loop is clean, you get to move on. And not only do you get to move on, but you should move on. And a loop is clean when there are no unwanted behaviors in that loop. So it's a phenomenal way for judging when you can change criteria. When a loop is clean, you get to move on. And not only do you get to move on, but you should move on. And a loop has to be clean on both sides of the click. So if I have an animal, a horse that is touching a target and touching it really well and touching it consistently in exactly the way that I want it to touch it, that's great. But if he's grabbing the food from my hand so that I'm counting fingers afterwards, I don't have a clean loop. And and I would want to look at the food delivery side of the click and clean that up before I started to move on to ask for more. Because anything that I have in the way of of unwanted behavior in that loop, I'll be carrying forward and weaving into the rest of my training. And then that expression, when a loop is clean, you get to move on. And not only do you get to move on, you should move on, means that you do, it, it, it helps you to uh, keep from building what I think of as glass ceilings in your training. So for example, if I uh, I might ask a horse to back up, but backing is hard work. So maybe I'll just ask for three steps, click and treat. And I ask for three steps, click and treat. And I keep asking for three steps, click and treat until the day that I need four steps. And so I withhold my click because I need the fourth step. And my horse is going, oh, no, 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 no. That's not the behavior. I, you may not know it, but I can count and I should have been clicked. Well, I've built a glass ceiling into my training because I didn't move the criteria along. And for many uh, sort of novice trainers, they inadvertently build glass ceilings. They stay too long. They either move the training along too fast, so they're lumping, they ask for too much too fast, their loops are not clean, or they don't move the training along uh, at a steady enough pace and they get kind of mired down. So the loopy training is just a phenomenal way of structuring your training. This is awesome because I did not know about all of this stuff because... 
you need to still go have a conversation with Karen Pryor and the clicker faculty to bring it over to Australasia. But I'll, I'll leave that in your hands, <laughs> Alex. <laughs> um, and, and excited that you thought back then when talking to Jesus that you know we had to make sure that this was documented. Uh, and we uh, could make sure that everyone moving forward got an opportunity to to listen to it, to learn about it, so it didn't get lost. That's right. And so I do. So we have uh, within the DVD series that I've produced, I have the Poison Q, which is Jesus's lecture, and it um, it it has subtitles. So if you get lost, because he has a he has a very strong Mexican accent. So if you get a little bit lost in the accent, uh, the subtitles help. And then also because it was um, it wasn't a presentation that was filmed at a conference. It was a presentation that he did uh, just for me that I could ask questions. And so when his first slide went up, which was filled with technical language, I said to him, Jesus, you've just lost 90% of the audience that I want to uh, see this this." this uh, lecture. Could you explain what you are saying on that slide? And so it's a phenomenal presentation because he takes the time to translate and explain to people who are not necessarily students of behavioral analysis what he is saying and what these uh, the terms that he's using what it means and um, and it again it has subtitles so if you if you are feeling a little bit lost you can pause you can um, you can go back through these sections and and really understand the significance of this study. Wonderful, and we'll make sure that we link to all of this stuff so that if you want to find it easily, you can just go to the podcast right up and find it from there. I think also in that uh, explanation of all of that stuff, and thank you for doing that, uh, Alex, you you did a contender for the title of the episode, and that, that is, if Ken and Kay do it, I want to do it too. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So can you potentially build on everything you've just shared with us and and give us some examples uh, from your own experience uh, where you've maybe uh, seen poison cues or people you're teaching um, or you've taught some a, a particular example where teaching loopy training to someone, um, a particular example that maybe sticks out in your mind. Uh, does anything come to mind that you can share with us? I'd love some, love some practical um well, it's all practical, but I'd love some uh, Alex um, Kurland specific examples of, of uh, this from her experience. Well, it's not a horse example, but one of the places that I saw poison cues most strongly um, was in the uh, guide dogs. So uh, one of my very good friends and clients is Ann Eady, uh, who is blind, and she had... Um, when I first met her, she had a wonderful guide dog, a Labrador retriever. And when she, when he, he, he got um, uh, cancer when he was 11 and died very suddenly. And she went back to one of the guide dog schools and got a German shepherd who was not a good working guide at all. And this dog... Um, had been trained with through some of the obstacle work with positive reinforcement, but proofed with corrections. And I saw such clear, clear evidence of the poison cue and the effect that it had on on animals. And I've um, I trained a miniature horse for Anne, so the. Um, uh, many people know about Panda. She's uh, an, a working guide that Anne has used now for 15 years. So the contrast between Panda, who was trained only with positive reinforcement, and with she ended up having two German Shepherds. One lasted for three months, and the other she tried to uh, have work for. She tried to keep the dog in work um but finally, after a year, had to send it back to the school because the poison, the the effect of the poison cues was uh, just too great. Um, so that really was one of the reasons that I was so fascinated and intrigued 
and wanted to understand the poison cues because I saw, you know, I saw such a clear demonstration of it. But I see it in the horses as well. We see, we'll see it often uh, when we're people are working a horse on a on a line where they're leading the horse, and the the horse will, you'll see a lot of avoidance behavior. Uh, you'll see the horses grabbing at the line, trying to keep the handler from sliding up the line because uh, they know that in the past, this line has been used to correct them. It's been used uh, to create a great deal of discomfort. So you see, uh, you'll see, you see this residual effect and that even though you are using positive reinforcement, you're not getting the joy and and I think this is one of the keys to really understanding that how we build behaviors in the first place really matters. So in the poison cue research, there was a point where they stopped using corrections at all on this dog. So when they said punir, if the dog came over promptly, it got clicked and reinforced. And in the training part of it, if it didn't, they would drag the dog over to them. And in the video clips from the research, being dragged was clearly aversive to this little dog. They weren't doing anything that you don't see all the time with pet owners. You know, I go to the if I go to the vet, I'll I can almost guarantee that somebody in the vet office will be dragging some poor dog across the floor. Or if I, you know, if I watch the dogs being um, walked around my neighborhood, at some point I'll see some poor dog that's being dragged away from something that it wants to go explore. So they weren't doing anything that isn't done all the time to dogs, but it was clearly adversive. And then at some point they stopped, at one point in the training, they stopped all corrections, but they continued with the study and they continued to see this, the effect of the punir cue. They, they saw this real suppressed behavior. And so they did a uh, a trial where the dog was to go out and touch, they had two objects. One was a waste paper basket and the other was a briefcase. And under the punir condition, the dog would uh, wander about the room. He'd uh, go out, he'd touch, let's say, the briefcase. The person would say punir, the dog would come back, and you'd see this dog wandering around the room. And if you had seen nothing else, if you just walked in at that point, in the experiment, you would say, oh, they're using clicker training. They're using positive reinforcement. But the dog doesn't look eager. He doesn't look happy. He doesn't look enthusiastic. It doesn't look like clicker training. I wonder what's going on. And and this, I think, is a really important piece to understand that how you start out, how you form a behavior matters. So if I'm working with a horse and I'm saying, I'm going to uh, use the positive reinforcement, but if you don't give me what I want, then I'm going to correct you. I could end up, I can think I'm using clicker, that I'm being a good positive reinforcement trainer, but I'm not going to get that joyful, enthusiastic, uh, eager participation that I would get if I started out uh, shaping well. And, and I think that's, a, that's an important piece when we're just beginning to explore clicker training and we think, well, it's okay, isn't it? If, if my horse bites me, I still get to hit him, don't I? Because he bit me. And, and the answer to that is, well, actually, no, what you get to do is go have a cup of tea and think about how you would change your training what is the what are the what would you rearrange in the environment so that you can manage that behavior you can be safe but you don't have to punish your your horse to do it and so with the the horses when we start out i generally have people start out with protective contact so i borrow an, an idea from the world that you're familiar with ryan which is we start with barriers between the horse and the handler and and I think that's a really important piece to bring into the the horse training and an understanding of what makes equine clicker training a little bit different from say dog training and and one of the places is that we really do I really do recommend the starting with protective contact. Well, all the horse people listening to that this uh, <laughs> at the start of your answer to that question going. It's not a horse example, but <laughs> I say, Alex, talk about horses. But it's, but it's also <laughs> relevant. Of course, we are, I'm, I'm only joking, and, and we all know that. So 
Alex, let's uh, think people in the podcast audience, uh, if they identify that potentially they have a, a, a situation where they're dealing with a poison cue um, and, and an important behaviour they need to train, maybe you can offer an example of what that might be, w- what is the direction that person should take? So I've, I've listened to this podcast, I've thought to my training, okay, I've gone, oh, that might be an example of a poison cue. The next uh, situation is go and have a beer or a cup of coffee <laughs> and think about it. What is what what are some more offerings that you can give people as to what they should do next? Try to work through it or try to come up with a plan that just completely removes that and work on something else. Where should they go? Well, the the easiest way to deal with poison cues is to change the cue. So, but that isn't always possible. So, if your poison cue is the one and only saddle that fits your horse, uh, you may not be able to just change the the saddle. Um, We've had situations where I think the poison cue was the training environment. Um, We had one horse I remember years ago at a clinic, this really um, wonderful Frisian, four-year-old. And in the barn aisle, when we were introducing him to the basics of clicker training, what an enthusiastic learner. What a fun, fun horse. But his... uh, his trainer was telling me that the reason that she'd been asked to work with him is the prior trainer had um, had been extremely aggressive with him, and the owner had not realized just how uh, how really aggressive she was being until she walked in one day and saw watched his training session, and then she immediately pulled the the horse from the trainer. Well, we went, we were having this great session in the barn aisle, and then we went into the arena, and I had a completely different horse. Horse just absolutely fell apart. And what I had not realized was that was the arena in which this horse had been trained. And he wanted no part of it. He just wanted out. So sometimes um, it's not always possible to change the the, the cue. I, you could say, well, okay, this, this arena is no good, so move. <laughs> well, it's not always practical. So one of the things that you can set up is, this is again where the loopy training becomes really important because it's go to a place in the training where you can get a consistent yes answer. And set up, you may have to change things in the environment. So for example, in that arena, I would want to build a classroom. I would want to build a training space within that arena that looked different, that maybe what I would do is set up um, a circle of cones, or um, if you had them, if you had the luxury of panels, you could set up uh, a, a separate classroom space made with the panels, but have something that was a definite environmental marker. This In this space, this is safe. It might be taking mats into the arena. So you start out in your barn aisle and you establish these um, going to mats and standing on mats or working in this circle of cones. And then you take those into this poison cue environment. So it changes the environment. It, it's a, a signal to the horse that this is different. And then you use the loopy training strategy to find a place in the training, something where you can get a consistent yes answer and you build from that. And one of the reasons that I was so interested in the loopy training and have explored it in the way that I have is because so often we have horses that uh, it's really a challenge to find that simple, small starting point where they can give you a response. We had a, it was, oh, it was so much fun. We had a horse at a clinic, um, was a, he was an Arab and really shut down horse and totally out of balance. He, he, every time he stopped, he, every, every leg was going in a different direction. He was standing, I refer to it as um, higgledy piggledy. He was, he was uh, always, he just was always out of balance. And he looked Oh, he looked awful. If somebody had said to me, oh, would you like to go for a ride? You know, let's go for a trail ride. I could saddle him up for you. I would have found any excuse possible to avoid getting on that horse because it just would have looked as though it was so unfair to ride a horse whose back was so broken down, whose balance was so terrible. And so we worked him in the clinic. He had a 
his handler, uh, he was a borrowed horse. So uh, his owner had, had agreed to let us use him in this clinic. And his handler was a lovely person who had really pretty handling skills. And we did this very, very basic, very simple lesson that involved teaching him to go to mats. But I refer to it as the runway lesson, where you uh, it's constructional training. You build the skill before you need the skill. And so we were away from the mat asking for requests to go forward, and he was so stuck. So it was simply, we're using a lead rope, you're sliding down the lead and and putting in a request. So I refer to it as shaping on a point of contact. So you don't add pressure, you just, you go to, a, uh, you slide down to the point where you can put an ask, but if you don't get an immediate response, there's no escalating, you just wait. And this horse would give this tiny little shift of balance and click and reinforce that and ask again. And and then another tiny little shift of balance. Well, over the course of the three days, the transformation of this horse was astounding. His balance completely changed. So instead of stopping all out of balance and very downhill, he started to stop in balance he started to stop square. He was standing over himself. He picked his top line up. He picked up. He he started. Uh, he started to look really beautiful. And now he was looking like a horse. If somebody had said, "Would you like to go for a ride?" I would have looked at him and said, "Oh, yeah, I think so." Um, because the transformation in the way he was holding himself was just astounding. And it came from finding that one tiny, tiny little piece of behavior that we could get and reinforce consistently and then grow. And it, we left it up to him to, exp- so we were asking him questions. We weren't telling him where to put his feet. We weren't telling him how to arrange his body. We weren't placing, you know, put your foot here. Um, we were letting him discover and explore his body in the way that a person might who was having, say, a Feldenkrais or an Alexander uh, 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 session where you learn about your own, you become very um, aware of your own balance. And this horse, through this process, became very aware of his own balance and completely changed in his appearance. So we were starting with poison cues, and we ended up with uh, with a real transformation in this horse, a really beautiful horse. So loopy training, the mentor is when the when loop, is, loop clean, is clean, you get to move on. And not only sh- do you get to move on, but you should move on. And you want no other behaviors in that right. loop. You want no unwanted be So a loop is clean when there are no unwanted behaviors in the loop. And you want to find, and your, your tips are, if, you, if you're potentially stuck, is just to find that smallest, tiny little loop that you can uh, and potentially change the yep. antecedents of need be. Because um, often mm-hmm. we're going to find ourselves in that position, aren't we, where there are variables in our individual situation, which means we can't move to a new arena or get a new saddle. Right. Or... right. And one of, the, one of the easiest behaviors to get, unless you're working with a sperm whale, and I don't think many of us are, but one of the easiest behaviors that you can get on a consistent basis is um, an exhalation. So for the horses, for example, I can, I can put my hand, if I can put my hand near a horse's nostril and click as I feel them exhale. And then what I'm really getting built into the very beginning of that behavior is relaxation. So even if you have a really stuck horse, um, a really one of those that's just frozen and is not offering behavior, is not responding, but is just sort of like this lump that is, I'm, you, you tell me what to do and I'll move. But until then, I'm not going to, I'm not going to offer behavior that, um, the a very classically, a classic shut down horse, they're still breathing. And so if you click as they take that, as they exhale, boy, can you grow some amazing things out of that. And you know, you know you're going to get that behavior. So you're not waiting, 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 going through a horrific extinction process because you're withholding the click. They're going to exhale and they're going to exhale on uh, frequently enough that you can begin to push the rates of reinforcement up. Beautiful. So my, my next question is, uh, where do we start with a sperm whale? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I haven't trained any sperm whales, so I will leave that up to the cetacean experts. Uh, I, lo- I loved your, I think you've potentially used the, the favorite label that we've ever had on the show, which is uh, Hickledy Piggledy. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> I'm going to use that from now on. Any, any more tips, f- just before we move on to um, moving towards the end of the episode, any more tips for uh, everyone about working with loops and um, problem solving poison cues? I'd say just go out and start experimenting and um, and see and and observing. So what you may discover is that you're already training in loops. So uh, loopy training is is one of those things that if you're a good trainer, you're probably already using loopy training. And and it's just kind of fun to say, oh, it has a name, and then you can be more deliberate in training in loops. So it, it uh, rather than jumping all over the place in your training, you just become a lot more deliberate. Wonderful. I can't wait to, to learn more about this. Uh, I learned a lot in that last uh, a little bit, and I know it's just not going to leave my mind now for the next uh, few weeks. And as I move forward in the training yeah. session with Phoebe, so, so it'll this. be interesting. It'll be interesting to hear back as you do explore this idea of the next time you're training, you suddenly go, oh look at that. I am training in loops. Or do you say, oh, look at that. I'm I'm actually a, I'm a higgledy-piggledy trainer. I'm sort of all over the place in my training. No wonder my animals are kind of a little bit confused. So it'll be interesting. Or, or oh, I could make this, I could make this uh, easier for my animal if I became more structured in a loop. So it'll be interesting to uh, get some dif- get some feedback from you in terms of does loopy training when you start actually doing some training does it make sense? Are you saying oh, I'm already doing this or oh right I sh- I could change my training just a little bit here and oh look at that my learner is so much more successful now. Um, that I've got this this structure to my training. Very happy to provide this update for you. We are working with a pair pair of scissors at the moment near um, a particular body part, which I believe have uh, potentially been poisoned. I don't know if that's the right syntax to use for how I said that, but you get what I mean. Um, and working with uh, a flow chart that I've come up about this training session. It's going well, but I think I think I can incorporate the information you provided today and uh make a cup of tea after this um sit down and, and think it through and <laughs> and then very happy to um touch base with you and and also somehow report it back to everyone listening um yeah, how that, went. That, yeah that and actually that would be really interesting for me because i have one of the goats the cashmere goats that i have they they have this wonderfully long extravagant hair that has to be combed and he um He's had his fleece combed out, not by me, but prior to my handling of him. And for him, it's been very painful. So body contact and combing is something that he is not happy with. So any success you have with scissors and so on uh, and your flow chart, I would love to get feedback on because the more ideas around how to how to overcome some of these experiences that our animals come with uh, is always useful. And whether it's a goat that doesn't want to be combed or a horse that doesn't want to be groomed or saddled or a dog that uh, has had unfortunate experiences with a groomer or whatever it is, it's it's um, the more ideas that all of us come up with, the more strategies we come up with, the, the better it is for our animals. Yeah, well, I filmed some of what I was doing yesterday, uh, using a lot of behavioral momentum to add in. Uh, the scissor, the behaviour that is associated with the scissors in the middle of a lot of easy behaviours, but but there is some um, there's some junk in there around that space. So I think uh, digesting everything from our conversation today, and um, I can share the before and after videos maybe. Oh, uh, excellent! Down the track. Hey, let's go now to a question I really love asking people, and the final question for this episode just before we do wrap up. Alex, you took us back to the early 90s when something called videotapes was around and told us about your beginnings when you read Don't Shoot the Dog and shared some stories from then. 
I'd like us now, please, if it's okay with you, to think forward. And, and we've already done this too a little bit, so maybe you just want to say, as I said earlier, or um, build upon what you've already contributed in your offerings today. But wh- where do you see all of the stuff that we're doing in 2018, we being positive reinforcement, animal trainers, uh, and, and the people that are doing positive reinforcement with horses, sperm whales, plants? Uh, <laughs> where, where is all this going? What do you really want to see happen? Um, what do you want to see more of over the next five to ten years? Well, I think what I'd really, really love to see happen, and it is happening to a certain extent, is the recognition of what an intelligent planet we live on. And the this recognition that horses are intelligent and they have rich emotional lives, That uh, and it's not just horses, but it's really all animals, and that we really begin to acknowledge that and we change how we uh, manage animals, care for animals, relate to them, talk about them, that we begin to make changes for the farm animals, uh, and that the horses are uh, a spearhead for making those changes. Spearhead's probably the wrong the wrong metaphor there, but that uh, that the horses are a big part of contributing to our seeing animals in this different light that we what we talked about at the very beginning of the podcast and the changes in how we view animals not just horses but animals in general you know when when Ken Ramirez did the 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 butterfly um, experiment and trained over you know 10,000 butterflies and one of his comments was who knew that there were that butterflies could be bullies um, which I I just loved and that we that we really see the uh, intelligence of animals and we see that there are emotional needs that particularly the animals that are under our care that um, that needs to be addressed. Well it excites me that we've turned this episode about mainly loopy training into a pretty loopy episode <laughs> linking at the start of the episode of how intelligent this planet we live on is to the end of the episode where we ended up talking about how intelligent this planet we live on is. Nice loop there, Alexander. That's right, exactly. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for sharing everything today, Alex. Just before we do wrap up, can you tell everyone listening where they can go to to find out more, to, to find the DVD series you have and uh, get in touch, etc. cetera? So social media, Absolutely. websites. Yep. Thank you. So I uh, have several websites. So The Clicker Center, you have to have the the in there. Theclickercenter.com is my main site. Then I have an extensive blog. So theclickercenterblog.com. And there's a lot of articles there, including a book that I've published on, on online in the blog. And then i um, there's the clickercentercourse.com and the podcast is equosity.com and that's equus plus curiosity you get equosity so uh, all those those references will get you to uh, they'll get you to me nice word sandwich there much more creative than the Animal Training Academy podcast. <laughs> but we, we will link to all of the stuff in the show notes for everyone listening. Hey, once again, Alex, from myself and on behalf of everyone listening and all the animals that these people are, their humans for, <laughs> and all of the <laughs> ripples that will flow from this yes. episode. Uh, for today, for catching up with me a few weeks ago, sending emails back and forth, we really appreciate you you making time to, to come and hang out with us here at Animal Training Academy. Thank you. Well, it's been a pleasure, so thank you. You are, of course, more than welcome. Everyone listening out there, we really appreciate you as well for taking time to tune in uh, and hang out with us today. If you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about poison cues, loopy training, and the wonders of this very intelligent planet that we live on, as well as working with animals in the most positive, funnish, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of the episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com, click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix. Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks there's something there for absolutely everyone and we're looking forward to having you join the tribe that's it for this episode though we're going to wrap it up there thanks again so much for listening everyone and you'll hear from us again soon Mm -hmm.